Hello again. One of the odd things I've noticed about many people with a supposedly rational or scientific view of the world is the way in which certain areas of human life are automatically exempt from evidence-based examination. In other words, they don't want to think about them or discuss them reasonably. Race and differences between racial groups are one of those areas where people freeze up and don't want to think about it. And family life is another area. The evidence, the overwhelming evidence, is that traditional family life of Europe and Asia, the nuclear family where children are raised by both biological parents, is by far and away the best uh, for the children. It predicts the best outcomes for children, far better than when they're raised by single parents or a succession of father substitutes, as often happens these days. The only thing is that popularly all these alternative views, all the alternative models apart from the nuclear family, are touted as being just as adequate. We mustn't be judgmental about it, is the general view of things, that we have to accord all family structures equal respect. Now, this is a curious situation because if you examine families in a purely Darwinian way, in a purely scientific way, you can see immediately what's likely to happen to children that aren't raised by both biological parents. However, in this case, ideology trumps science. The ideology of accepting that any type of family is just as good as any other type is ideology, it's not science, it's certainly got nothing to do with the evidence. And the problem is that when ideology beats science, you'll end up with a situation like Nazi Germany or Soviet Russia. And it means that any sort of madness is possible, any crazy views can prevail. And the people that usually suffer worst are children. I doubt many viewers are likely to have heard of the expression infanticidal coup. It's something that's quite common in the animal world and indeed the human world. When a male lion teams up with a lioness who already has cubs, one of the first things he does is kill all the cubs because he doesn't want any other genetic material to survive other than his own. The lioness usually acquiesces in this. The same thing happens with primates. Uh, Hanuman Langas of India, for instance, whenever a new partner appears, suddenly all the previous offspring vanish. And of course what's happened is that the new partner has disposed of them for, as I say, purely Darwinian reasons. There's two chief reasons for these massacres to which the mothers often turn a blind eye. First, a new partner wants to ensure the survival of his own genes. So he doesn't want any rivals about, so he'll kill off any cubs which are likely to propagate the gene to another male. The second thing, he wants to make sure that food and other resources are not too thinly distributed. In other words, if the male lion brings home big chunks of meat, he wants to be sure that his own cubs will have the whole lot rather than have to share them with somebody else's cubs, which is quite reasonable, of course. There's the same imperative is at work in so-called blended families today, that's human families which contain a stepfather. I say a stepfather rather than a stepmother, because children usually stay with their mother, so stepparents are almost invariably male. It has been said by some researching in the field that, and I quote, having a step-parent is the most powerful risk factor for severe child maltreatment yet discovered. But one of the strange things about this subject is that no one really wants to talk about it. Everyone wants to pretend that step-parents love their new partner's children as though they were his own. It's not true. Um, so when I say everybody, what I mean here is that in everyday life, not just researchers, not just ideologues or newspaper journalists, in real life, if you meet people that have uh, men that have picked up with a new family, 
they almost invariably claim that they love the partner's children and they treat them as their own. But of course it's not true. Whenever anonymous surveys are carried out, vigorous surveys by universities and so on, and the um, respondents can speak without being identified, step parents always admit that they don't really love their children, their stepchildren as much as their own children. They sometimes feel fond of them, they're affectionate for them, but they don't love them and they don't expect the stepchildren to love them either. Usually it's enough for them if they can get the children to respect them rather than love them. So this makes things very tricky for the stepchildren. Okay, the lack of love is a minor thing when you consider what actually happens to stepchildren in their lives very often. Co-residing step-parents are 70 times more likely to kill a child under two than a genetic parent is. Even without thinking about killing the kids, step-parents are 150 times more likely to slap, push or hit a child than a genetic parent is. The survey in Finland revealed that step-parents are 20 times more likely to sexually abuse girls than their fathers are. There's no incest taboo at work in a blended family. So whereas the average male would be very hesitant to interfere with his own teenage daughter, if he's living with a teenage girl, the um, taboo's not there. He's more inclined to see her as an available female. And of course, one last thing, stepchildren tend to leave home at a much earlier age than children living with their biological parents. Whether they run or they're pushed is a, another question, but it's a, undoubtedly the case that they do leave home earlier than children living with their mum and dad. What's really interesting is that deaths from all causes for stepchildren tend to be much higher than for those children living with both their natural parents. So fires, illness, road accidents, drownings, all those things affect stepchildren more than they do children living with their biological parents. And these are also part of infanticidal coups, only indirectly. I mean, what's happening is that the man's not burning his house down to get rid of an annoying stepchild. Stop and think for a moment, those of you that have children, if you're in a burning building with your child and other children to whom you're not related, who are you going to save first? Who are you going to put your most efforts into? It's going to be your own biological child. You Obviously you'll try and help other children, but your main priority is going to be your child. It's the same thing if there were a shipwreck and children were floundering in the water, your own child would be your priority. You wouldn't really be, uh, once your own child was secure, you might worry about other people's kids. Um, it's the same thing applies when you're crossing the road. The same thing applies to seeing the early signs of meningitis, for example. You'd be more notice you, you're more aware of your own child's body. You would spot those warning signs earlier than you would in a child to whom you were not related. What this means is that a child living with both parents has got two adults constantly watching out, watching for signs, taking care of them, uh, making sure that they get the right nutrition. A child that's living with his mother and a stepfather only has one parent wholeheartedly devoted to his own interests. And strictly from the point of view of percentages, that shows when it comes to looking at statistics for road accidents and fires. The family structure of stable marriages versus a succession of step parents is often tied in with races. And again, race is a taboo subject family structure is a taboo subject. These two things combine together. I want to look in the next video at this business. I want to look at race also from a Darwinian perspective and see why nobody wants to think about race anymore and how it ties in with family structure, childhood, crime, teenage pregnancy and various things like that.